answer you. So if you if you name a playing card, any playing card, just name it out loud. Uh, six of, cl- of clubs. Six of clubs. And there's no way, way I could know beforehand you would choose the six of clubs. <laughs> now, no, be, be deadly honest with it. This is going to be strange because some of the people are just listening, so they're not going to they're not going to understand. But as I go through this cards here, you'll notice that all the cards face in one direction, except for one card that's upside down, and this is the one I turned over. <laughs> Come on, bro. <laughs> That's the six of clubs. That's uh, mentalism because there's no sleight of hand involved, right? It's like it really uh, was in your mind, and you and you you blurted it out, and you blurted out the right room. Thank thank goodness. That's mentalism. <laughs> Welcome to the First Coast.fm podcast, a creative platform of expression for musicians, artists, filmmakers, and the unsung heroes who behind the scenes help to make the First Coast of Florida a community rich in culture and a melted pot of ideas. I'm your host, Fernando Bernal. So, Bill, welcome to the show. It's my pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to pleasure you with my magic. You got something off your sleeve. <laughs> yeah, that was a loaded uh, response. Sorry. <laughs> Let's move no on worries. quickly. <laughs> so, so let, let me ask you something. I, I, this is I'm very curious. I've always have been impressed with magic since I was a little kid. Mm-hmm. Now, in my country, they deal with different types of magic, green magic, black magic, a santeria and all that kind of mm-hmm. stuff, right? So, but as a child, I was always uh, impressed and, and, and amazed by it. In fact, uh, most of the magic that I remember as a kid was through a radio station, and it was all in Spanish, mm-hmm. and it was about an Indian magician called Mandrake. Yes. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and we just listened to it, mm-hmm. and we visualized uh, the the tricks on the radio. So it's right. like, you know, what are you gonna do? But why magic? Why why what? Why do you choose that path? You know, like, I, I don't know if I have a philosophy, but I have a, I, I kind of attribute my theory of life to the idea that you don't choose it, it chooses you. I feel like as a child, I was a performer since I was about three. My father was a musician, concert pianist, wow. composer, and I started playing the violin when I was three years old. And he put me on stage as my first memory of was performing. I was five years old and I was in front of a school auditorium and playing the violin and so that's where my performing end of things I just that's all I've been doing it wasn't until I was about 12 that I I got a magic set for Christmas and then some neighborhood friends of uh, of mine uh, we both we all got together and let's do a magic show we had no idea what we were doing uh, we went to the local I think it was a drugstore or something that had some you know some cheap magic tricks for for you know that we could afford we bought them brought them home fooled around and like, okay, we're going to do, and we'd already done, you know, some puppet shows and we had done uh, a couple little plays in the backyard for the neighborhood, you know, whoever would show up. And we just switched that to magic. And I think magic, that people in magic, the magic world talk about getting bit by the magic bug. It's kind of like that. It's like Spider-Man, you know, he's bit by the spider. Now he's Spider-Man. Magic kind of gets a hold on you. Like, and it kind of came at the right time. I was 12. You know, so it was kind of like a teen, preteen and, you know, worst time of life for a lot of people, a lot, mm-hmm. of, a lot of people that age. So for me, magic was a vehicle to socialize, to be able to talk to girls, to be able to fool adults and, you know, to get their attention. And all of a sudden you're fooling, you're fooling at your parents or, you know, other adults. And now you have a superpower like, oh, they actually care what I'm doing. You know, they actually, you know, paying attention. So I, I think that all helped subconsciously and not not at any conscious level but in retrospect looking at it i feel like magic came at the right time in my life and so why magic i i think magic just uh i just started and then i just took off from there and it never stopped i never stopped doing magic there was never a time where i'm like okay i'm gonna grow up (laughs) right right never i've never grown up so you you were 12 12 and this is uh, in canada you're canadian yeah uh, at that age, I don't know how many years that goes back to what what yeah, yeah. time frame. I'm 96, so whatever that works out to be, probably, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, who was your influence at that time? I mean, today, with YouTube and all the social media, right. you can be influenced so much by so many different yeah. people. But back then, yeah. who caught your, your, your attention? So my parents were weird. 
we never had a TV growing up. We didn't have television. So it was a decision my mom made, I think, uh, because she just saw how addicted, you know, everyone. She, she, I think she, what she told me later in life was that she, she had an addiction to TV. She said, if I have it in the house, that's all I'll, that's all I'll be doing. So for, you know, for our health and hers, she just decided not to have one. So we didn't have one, but it's not that we didn't, we used to rent 16 millimeter movies from the library, like hundreds of them on weekends. And so it's not like we didn't watch things. It was just a different mode. You know, we would go to a friend's house or my grandmother's house and watch TV. But without that, there was just more creativity, I feel, you right. know, creative base, you know, and obviously within a musical family, music was always there. So um, I have no idea what your question was, from from this, but what what I'm saying is, I feel like who influenced you? Yes, because <laughs> a lot of question. a lot of it magic is it's magical is a visual art, obviously. Right, right. I mean, there there are tricks you can do for blind people, for, for the most part, it's a visual art. So magic, uh, what my influences were, I have a young, I have faint memories of seeing a magician when I was very young, probably in six or seven years old, in Niagara Falls. There used to be a Harry Houdini museum. Uh, there, they had a lot of artifacts, and then they had a live magician doing tricks. That has sent that that burned down, I think, in the eighties. But that's from the seventies and eighties. That's we I remember going there and seeing that. And then when I was very young, uh, we went to the Simpsons Christmas party in Toronto, downtown Toronto. Simpsons was like a department store, and they had this pancake breakfast with Santa. So you're you're excited for the pancakes. Santa's going to be there, and then they had a magician. And I remember him, he was he was like a hippie, he was playing the guitar, then he would do magic tricks, and I just was transfixed. I don't know, I honestly don't know my age. Um, but it was Doug, it was Doug Henning before he went to Broadway. So it was like in the 70s for sure, but before he did like uh the, the magic show and what he became famous for later on. But he was doing gigs in Toronto, and that was one of his gigs, was this Santa's, you know, pancake Santa breakfast. And he and we have I have pictures of it and stuff. It's it's very cool. So these were early influences of live magicians. Right, right. Um, and then when I was about fourteen, my dad's uh, company, my dad worked for. He was in sales. He, they had hired a magician for their trade show. So he snuck me into the trade show floor, and from about nine in the morning till six p.m. He's doing he's doing magic every ten minutes. A mini magic show. This guy named Paul Gertner, and I didn't know at the time, but he was he's a world renowned sleight of hand magician. He's he's been known. He's been active for 60, 70 years now. He's fantastic, and that was the first guy that I recognized at fourteen that was making a living doing it. And they're all whispering on the trade show floor. All these sales guys, you know, he's making like a thousand bucks a day, a thousand bucks a day. He's doing slightly back, back then, back in the probably the eighties. Money now, yeah. And people, people are. And, and as a kid, I'm like, like a thousand dollars. You know, <laughs> it's like a sure. lifetime of money. Like it was like mind blowing, but it, it definitely showed me that there was a living to be made doing this thing. Mm. Uh, I mean, little did I know. It takes a lot of work to make a living doing any art, but I think magic, you know, although it's popular, it's like you got to eke out your existence. But those were the early influences. And definitely Paul Gertner was definitely probably my the strongest influence at that time, at a time in my life where I was like, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? I don't know what I want to be. I, I love magic. And that was always a constant. I went in and out of music. I took piano lessons. I took violin lessons. I. You know, but then magic was what I got a degree in, in sociology, but I never I mean, I use that to my advantage now as a sure. magician. But uh, I when I worked in the field for a couple of years, but then went back to magic again. So magic always has been the constant common thread, common right. thread. Right. Throughout. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned Houdini earlier mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I was I've always was intrigued by his life and and the time that he was uh soliciting the services of some clairvoyant lady mm. to get in contact with his mother mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. And he started with magic. Yeah. But tell me, what is the difference between a magician, an illusionist, mm -hmm. a mentalist? Mm -hmm. uh, what else have we got in there? Uh, yeah, at least those ones. Well, what is the difference between those? And what's the common thread? The common thread is... is uh, deception for entertainment. That's the common thread. Uh, but the, the main, uh, as the main thread, 
But each one of those things that you mentioned deals with a different subject of a different part of magic, although it's still magic, like a mentalist, uh, you know, most mentalists who are who have uh, some morality, they will tell you, you know, it's a trick. They may say that, you know, I'm using your, you know, your your five senses against you to create a to create a sixth sense. But I'm not psychic. Do you know what I mean? Like there, there, there's that thing. But mentalists deal primarily with something with the mind. So if I were to say to you, um, let's see, if I were to say to you, I've turned over a, a card in this deck of cards. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but I want you to tell me what you think it is. And I'm not going to tell I'm like what I will tell you, though, is I'm trying to influence you. So if you if you name a playing card, any playing card, just name it out loud. Uh, six of, cl- of clubs. Six of clubs. And there's no way, way I could know. Beforehand, you would choose the six of clubs. Now, no, be, be deadly honest with this. this is going to be strange because some of the people are just listening, so they're not going to they're not going to understand. But as I go through this cards here, you'll notice that all the cards face in one direction, except for one card that's upside down, and this is the one I turned over. <laughs> Come on, bro. <laughs> that's the six of clubs. That's uh, mentalism because there's no sleight of hand involved, right? It's like it really uh, was in your mind, and you and you you blurted it out, and you blurted out the right word. Thank thank goodness. That's mentalism. <laughs> you know, if 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 a mentalist were to do a card trick, that's what it would look like. Uh, stripped out, man. You're a little nuts. <laughs> so, do you think there are some mentalists who eventually begin to believe that they actually have psychic powers? You mentioned there's a earlier. lot that have become. So it's it's a slippery slope. I uh-huh. actually did mentalism for two years, strictly mentalism, probably when I was in my mid thirties, and I I eventually stopped doing it only because I had people repeatedly come up to me after my show, even at corporate events, private parties, and stuff, and say, you know, my 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 mother passed away, and I was wondering if you could connect with her, you know, and, and maybe maybe she she can you can we can connect, and she can send me a, a, a sign or a signal or a message from beyond and I just came to realize that when it's so powerful that's that's a slippery slope and and now you're going into different realms that I'm not comfortable with as an entertainer so for me mentalism is great but you know there's there's a big it's not that people are gullible well, people are gullible but people are they're seeking things that when they see someone that has that appears to have a gift like now I have a, you think, oh, he, but there must be some power he has that he knows the card I'm going to pick before I choose it in my mind. But now maybe he can, maybe he can uh, talk to my, my dead cat or something. So I feel like there's, there's that, which I realized I wasn't comfortable with. So I moved on from that to keep it entertaining. And I still do mentalism in my show. Um, there's a couple pieces in my new show at the Casa Monica that are very powerful mentalism pieces. And we've had, I've even last, last, this past Saturday, a woman was crying and, but that's not by design to like <laughs> disrupt someone's, you know, emotional state, but sometimes it's that powerful. And I think ma- magic does have power. I'm just uncomfortable with, for me is, is to go beyond what people are comfortable with in terms of like, if you, if you feel like. I think this goes beyond magic. I think he's psychic. That's not right. Right. And then they start having faith and prestige in, in you. Yeah. And they truthfully believe that mm-hmm. you're some type of uh, yeah psychic. And, so back and, to Houdini. He, you know, he he started as a, a card magician. Started doing escape escapism, where he would tie himself up in a chains and whatever, and throw himself over the right. over a bridge and escape. And and then then his kind of like his. Later years, he debunked psychics. Right. There's a secret sort of motivation, you know, that's been written about that he was actually trying to find a real psychic so that he could get in touch with his dead mother, who he was right. very close to, you know, in life. So, but, you know, his whole thing was debunking these psychics. You know, right. they're just using magic tricks. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, they're, they're trying to dupe people into believing that they're communicating with their dead relatives. So the reality is I want to, we need to expose these people, you know, be, so they don't take advantage of, you know, people in their grief or their, right. you know. Do you think that uh, uh, a magician at some point maybe gets uh, uh, tired or jaded of the same uh, 
I hate the word tricks, but tricks that yeah. they're doing, and they decide to move into another level, like uh, mentalist or skate artist. That's what I was wondering about Houdini. At yeah. what point did he decide, well, maybe this is not giving me enough dopamine. I'm not getting my, my kicks out of this. Yeah. I'm going to do something a little more risky. Yeah. And this, so I've always had the gift or whatever you want to call it. I've always had the 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 uh, ability to to wrap humor in what I do, which gives me a little bit of the um, the 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 work of a stand up comedian. So I'm always writing jokes to go with the magic and or presentations or premises that have a humorous spin because I always find that that's it, it alleviates people's when you are so astonished by something that's so crazy. You know, a lot of people react in laughter because it's like, this is crazy. What? You know, and for for me, humor has always been a really big part of that. And I feel like uh, w- like what you're saying, if like if you want to change from a lot of people change the type of magic they do because they're not getting. I mean, if, if you're doing this professionally, you need to make a living. Right. So if you're doing card tricks at a bar and you're working for tips and you're only getting 40 bucks a night in tips. It's not paying the rent. So now you're like, what if, you know, if I put myself in a straight jacket and then hang from a building, more people will see me. I'll get some press. You'll get some media attention. That's a lot of, a lot of the reasoning behind that is, is publicity. Publicity. Kind of. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is where Houdini really, sh- we're still talking about Houdini, not because in all honesty, he was a great magician. He was a great marketer. Great right. marketer. And that's why he kept changing the changing his role. So he started as the king of cards, right. the king of card tricks. And then he moved from that to he's the you know the the escape artist. You know, nobody people other people had done it before him, but nobody had done it at his at the at the level he did it. You know, and then he moved from that. You know, obviously that takes a physical strain. And when you become older, it's like, well, what am I going to do now? Am I going to? I'm 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 50. Am I going to hang myself from a from a from a crane right. upside down? You know, on a fiery rope and escape from chains. So then he moved from that to debunking psychics. And I really truly believe that, although he was interested in all these things, he was motivated by. So here's a crazy story. Houdini used to have a police radio in his apartment in Manhattan. Day and night, it was on all the time. It would drive his wife crazy. He'd be lying in bed. It was always on. He would hear, oh, there's a fire at uh, whatever, you know, 29th and, th- and 3rd Street. He'd get he'd get a taxi or get in his car, get there as soon as he could. Uh, so then as soon as the press showed up, he would be there. Houdini witnesses fire. Houdini, you know, uh. alerts. Because his whole thing was like, if sure. the more my name is in the press... The more people are going to talk about me. And that's why we're literally still talking about him today. Because that's what's his, that's really was his. Bright, bright. Yeah. yeah very, I mean, very intelligent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a dedication though that, yeah. you know, even I'm at that level, I'm not really yeah, <laughs> interested yeah, yeah. in. And it's but, kind of heartbreaking to find how he eventually uh, moved on to the other side. You know, Yeah, bizarre. That punch on his stomach. Or, By a Canadian, a Canadian and, uh, university student. Oh. From McGill, I think. Yeah, he was uh, on a train from. Don't quote me; my memory is not great, but uh, I think to Montreal or from Montreal. So it was a McGill student, and he had this. He had a. He had a. He had many different challenges that he would be like. Oh, I can. You know, like there's various things I can do. One is that you can punch me as hard as you want in my stomach, and I, you know, right. I'll be able to take it. You know, he would have boxers come up and try it, and and this guy basically cold cocked him without any prior warning on a train he's probably walking through the <laughs> through the cars and like punch him he's like and it ruptured his appendix and then right. during the show i think it you know the poison got into his system and then oh he was actually doing a show when, well he when, did a show later that that uh that same i think it was that, either that night or the next night but mm-hmm. the, but the appendix had burst sure. was poisoning his uh right sepsis yeah 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 so an illusionist we mm-hmm. talked you mentioned mentalist Yes, illusionist. Okay, so an illusionist, so illusionist uh, is someone who does large magic. So think David Copperfield. Think um, I mentioned Doug Henning. Uh, people that do 
what we in the magic world we call them, you know, box tricks. And to, have, to do box tricks, you have to have box jumpers, and box jumpers are the the girls and guys who go into the boxes, get cut up, you know, split in half, and then put back together and then jump out again. And those are that's typically in the magic world what an illusionist is refer, refers to an illusionist. Now, um, I used to do a lot of shows at churches, and they didn't like the term magic because magic in, in, inferred. You know, the work of the devil or some sort of, you know, other Satan. Mm-hmm. Satan, yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> so instead of they said, well, we're comfortable with the term illusionist because what you're doing, ev- everything's an illusion. Mm. And I feel like that's, you know, that's what that's what they were comfortable with. So that in their terminology or their definition of the illusionist, especially for religious groups I used to perform for, that's was more comfortable to them. He's That's not a magician. Really interesting. He's, he's an illusionist because yeah. it's an illusion. In the magic world, illusionist is big tricks, big, you know, vanishing a helicopter. Make making, the Taj Mahal disappear. Taj Mahal disappear. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's a large scale, the scale yeah. of the magic. Um, I realized fairly on, early on, I actually, there was an illusion engineer, illusion manager of David Copperfields that lived like literally blocks from my house. So when I was 16, I bought a, box trick from him that he had made and kept it in my thing. I used to throw my sister in there and cut her in half and <laughs> pull her apart, put her back together again. We did it at a couple, um, we did it at a wedding with my, at my cousin's wedding. She hired us to, uh, to do magic and I, I did it there, but I learned very quickly that this, it was not me. I have no, you know, dance training or you really have to know how to stage movement, fill a stage. You're, you're working with dancers. You're working with, choreographers uh, or should be and it's a whole other bigger production I was just in love with sleight of hand magic so for me it didn't take I tried it but it, for me it wasn't you know I'm not a gymnast I'm not so for me it was like I, I shied away from that very quickly and also the expense you got to store all this stuff you got to drag it around in a, in a vehicle at a truck or something that and I just realized yeah that's not my my, my, not my cup of tea. I also real. I also, for me, I got way bigger reactions from sleight of hand magic that happened in people's hands or or mind reading, where somebody like I could, you know, somebody thinks of something and you reveal it. That got, in my opinion, that was way more powerful. So I didn't. I steered clear of that illusionist route where I felt like it was too much. First of all, budget budget wise alone, I couldn't afford these. Some of these illusions are tens of thousands of dollars. And, you know, when you're, a, when you're a kid in high school and even at college, I'm like, am I really going to afford all this? Like, you know, why? Just to drag it around in a truck that I also can't afford. And, you know, anyway, so that but sorry, I, 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 I'm rambling. But basically, the, that's the illusionist definition is that it's big magic illusions. Yeah. And David Copperfield is probably the best example you know, through the years, 80s, 90s, into the 2000s. And now and he's in Vegas at a, a residency at the MGM. And that's that's really, he really, I think he's, he was, he, he is and was the best, you know, to ever do it. Touring shows, he would tr- tour the world with with illusions. And Would you say Yuri Geller was one of the best in that field, a mentalist? Yuri, yes, Yuri Geller. Well, Yuri Geller, for the first I would say 10 to 20 years that he did it, he never he never associated himself or called himself a mentalist because he always he liked to play the this could potentially be real. So his <laughs> so he, he he had that dark side of not dark side. That's a, that's a that's a poor, poor explanation. But he had a he had a a penchant, I guess, is the best way to put it, to make it. You know, to keep it unknown, to keep it like, is he is he the real deal or is he not the real deal? And when he came on the scene, like nobody was bending spoons and forks. Right. But when he came on the scene in the in the 70s, you know, he would he would bend a fork, you know, with his mind apparently on, you know, the Mike Douglas show or whatever right, it was right. popular at the time. And then he would say, Check your drawers, you know, and people would call in like, My my fork bent, it's bent in the, you know, in my in my kitchen. I don't know how did you do that from the you know, I'm 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 in Idaho or whatever. Right. And and But that's he he started a whole sort of genre of magic. Not that mentalism didn't exist before. Mind readers were a thing, but he started a new realm of mind reading and, and mentalism. And and then what happened was he started getting chased by 
uh, James Randi, who was, who Randy, was, who yeah, was James Randi. you know, part of the, um, yeah. you know, sort of the skeptic, you know, he had, he had a whole foundation, the James Randi thing where he would be trying to, again, like Houdini, debunk. Right. Um, really debunk Erie Geller, but, but any, any time there would be a, a pseudo psychic on Johnny Carson or, you know, the, the older talk shows, he would then come on the next week and say, well, this is how they did it. You know, um, and part of me doesn't know how I feel about that. Cause I feel like it's like, I mean, <laughs> I always think like, because I know that it's not real quote unquote, I feel like it's like saying, uh, yeah, Santa, you know, there's no Santa, you know, it's like, it's like, yeah, we kind of know that. No? It's a kind of a wink, like, yeah. Right, right. But I guess for most people, like they, you know, if they buy into something and, you know, it's like, yeah, a guy can bend spoons with his mind. You're like, yeah, I guess it's true. I saw the guy and that's what, he said. what he said he was doing, he did. So I assumed it's, he knows how he was, what he was doing. In 2006. Yes. You were invited. Mm-hmm. To the Fetcher's Finger Frolic, Flickin' Frolic. Frickin'. <laughs> Fetcher's <Frickin'>. Flickin'. <laughs> Not frickin'. Fe- flickin'. <laughs> the 4F convention. We yeah, call it the 4F, 4F yeah. convention. What's the, that about? Fetcher's Finger fr- Flicking Frolic. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's funny. You, man, you dragged that out of a, the woodwork. So, uh, like my mentor, Paul Gertner, um, and a lot of top sleight of hand, the top sleight of hand people, especially in the US, but internationally, all convened to this one convention since I think probably since the seventies. So Eddie Fector owned <clears throat> owned sort of a, a small hotel and tavern um, in Batavia, New York, or Buffalo, New York. But Batavia is where that where it eventually started happening. And he just I, I don't know the exact history, but he put together basically this convention and all these guys who were sleight of hand. The gurus of sleight of hand from all across the U.S. would drive, you know, to this little ta- small tavern in uh, New York, New York State, and basically get together, perform for each other. It was a tavern, so there would be, um, you know, lay people there, like normal humans, in the bar, <laughs> in the restaurant, that they would, you know, all these magicians would attack with, with tons of magic. And it's it started very grassroots, sort of like he just invited a bunch of people and said, hey, if you know anybody, come, come, come. Then it became more of a uh, Obi O'Brien was the was a guy after Eddie Fector had passed away. And then he created they created this thing where it became a bigger convention. So there'd be like two, three hundred people. But it's by invite only. You have to be sponsored by one of the original members of uh, of the of the convention. So you can't just show up you have to be invited. And when you're invited, you have to perform in front of all these people. So when you go out, I was, I think, 2006. You just have to do the math. But I was pretty young, younger than I am now, obviously. <laughs> but going in front and you're all of a sudden you're in front of all your heroes, all your mentors, all the people that you've looked up to your entire life. And now you have to perform for them. You have to perform right. for 15, 20 minutes or whatever. Very nerve wracking. I bet. And also, you don't want to just do something they've already seen. Right. Right. So you have to come up with something, you know, that can be the really, you know, my not blow their mind because you're really probably not going to fool them, but something where they're going to be, oh, they, this, this kid's OK. Yeah. You want to stand out a bit so that people will. And that's what happened in 2006. I, um, uh, uh, my friend Nick, he's, he's, he's since passed away. He was he was the one who sponsored me and we went together and. uh yeah, so that was like it opened all kinds of doors for me. But, I met yeah. all kinds of magicians that you know otherwise I wouldn't have met. Right. Um, it also set me up at, at that same time. I started doing lecture tours, so I met all the people that set lecture tours up. So I used to go from town to town all through the U.S. and Canada, performing magic and teaching magic to other magicians. So that 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 started that whole ball rolling as well at that time. And but the fe- Fectors is is a they're, they're meeting this year again. I'm not I'm not gonna be able to make it, but they're meeting again this year and. Because uh, Obi O'Brien, the, the, the patriarch, I guess, that kept it going, had since passed away. So they've, I think they were, I don't know if they're going to continue it, but. They were doing it in April, I think it was when, when April, they were. April, yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's past. Past. And they're planning the next one now. So. Right. Yeah. Wow. Far out. Well, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty crazy thing. So when I was invited, that was a big deal. Really big deal. I, I, I Yeah. For me. Imagine. Yeah. You know, sure. For the average so, person. No one. Right. <laughs> no right. one knows. It's kind of an underground. Right. So. 
you were in front of all these top-notch magicians, mm-hmm. or card players and so on, mm-hmm. and of course you had to perform something that will do some oohs and ahs or yeah. something like that. Do you take past experiences, previous tricks you learn here and there, and synthesize them and make your own? Yes. Such as? Well, I'll tell you the trick I did in 2006. So I, uh, I've i always wanted to marry my musical abilities, which I've you know, retained, and do magic. So I came up with this trick where I would play the violin and do a card trick at the same time, which sounds hard because it takes two hands to play the violin. But I did this trick where I would have uh, three different people pick a card and and then they would stick it back in the stick the cards back in the deck and someone would shuffle the deck and then put the deck inside a, a crystal wine glass. And the whole premise was that we all know that certain notes and certain power the power of those notes can vibrate in some cases can break, you know, right, break wine right. glasses. You've heard like opera singers right, hit right. a certain note. Um, and the violin is like the human voice. It, it, it's the same range. So mm. you can hit certain notes and do the same thing. So my premise is that if I hit the right notes and uh, I can make your card, your particular card, vibrate, make the crystal vibrate enough that will it will vibrate and, and, and rise out of the deck from inside the wine glass. So, and that's what I did. So I would, I got three cards chosen, throw them in the wine glass, play the violin, and slowly each card was would, would vibrate out of the deck and fall out of the wine glass. That's tripped out, man. A little tripped out. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you have, uh, do you do that on your show at the Casa Monica? I have not yet, but uh-huh. that will be in the future because it, it is something that it just, it, it's a big undertaking to do that trick. So uh, in, in doing some research on this, mm-hmm. I, I came across some of the terms that you've used in some of the interviews that you had mm-hmm. on YouTube and you used the term loading. Mm. And uh, would this type of trick require a certain amount of loading or, or preparation? Yes. Prior to the audience coming in? Yes. Uh, there's a quote by Teller of Penn and Teller, and he says, people people are amazed by, by magicians, and this is not a direct quote because I'm just basically paraphrasing what he said, but people don't understand the lengths to which you've prepared for That's the moment of magic. Oh, sure. Thank you. You don't know the, <laughs> how much that someone's prepared, like the amount of work that goes into five seconds that you see in a magic show Literally for me, it took like 23 years to, to be able to come to do that trick, you know, because it started with me learning the violin. That's not something that everyone could do because I, I studied the Suzuki method. And if you know anything about the Suzuki yeah, method yeah. Of, of violin or, or Suzuki, music. They, they, yeah. Suzuki music school is that if you can learn it early enough, you're learning it like a language. So you're learning English, you know, as a, as a child. You're learning music at the same time, so you learn it and you have it in your in your psyche and your physical being like a language. So once it's there, it never leaves. And I truly I subscribe to that. I feel like that's true, and that's so for me. Like doing this type of trick where the violin playing the violin, yeah, it takes you have to get to that point where you're like you're comfortable playing the violin. Now you're adding the element of magic, which is a whole other thing. Right. Right. But um, yeah, you have a website. I went to your website mm-hmm. and I, I saw that you had a lot of uh, products for sale. Yes. Uh, where aspiring magicians mm-hmm. can learn mm-hmm. to do some of these tricks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At, at what point do you feel that you're still on a safe uh, uh, terrain and not revealing secrets and, and breaking the an oath that I understand magicians have? to not reveal yeah. how to do certain things. But yet Ma- you- magic comes down to desire and effort. If you desire, really desire to know a secret and you really desire to make the effort to find out what that secret is. I would say that 80 to 90% of my show, even currently, if you find the right public library, the secrets are there. There's a reference library in Toronto that had an amazing array of magic books like a you know like a whole stack of magic books a whole like you know floor to ceiling um eight eight to ten foot stack of magic that if you studied 
four of those books, you would have a career in magic if you learned those tricks. Wow. Yeah. The secrets are there if you want them. Uh-huh. Now, uh, the re- re- website you're referring to, BillAbbottMagic.com, that is, we, pr- we create magic for other performers. It's not, it's not something you'll see at a tourist magic shop where it's like they, they teach you how to do, you know, the, the card, the Spangali card. Is that open to the public in general? So it's, it, it's, it, it's open. I mean, you could, you could buy it, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't have anything to do with it. You wouldn't know, what to, you wouldn't know. But we really market to a very niche market oh, within the magic right. world that is professional performers because it's, it's, and we built our brand, I guess, or our, our company based on. I just I, I was actually the lecturer very soon, just before 2006, I lectured at my local magic shop in Toronto. I uh, was invited by the owner. He said, you know, you've got a really good you got lots of great takes on, on classics of magic. And you, I would love to have to come do a lecture. Just do what you do. So I did what I did. I was working restaurants, doing table side magic and sleight of hand. And I started doing a lecture and magicians thought it was great. They really enjoyed the material. So that's what, and we had a young family at the time, both of our boys who, you know, William and Sam. Yes, great kids. Yeah. Uh, who say hi. And Give them my regards. They, um, they were very young at the time. They were toddler. I think William was maybe three. Sam was maybe one. Uh, the performing lifestyle is very hit and miss and very, you know, transient, very up roller coaster. You know, you, you're either, it's feast or famine. So what, the lecturing and the selling of magic helps us to definitely help you know our family to do or help me to do was to make money while we while I wasn't performing and make, make a generate an income because all these interest magicians were interested in my material so and that's when we started well Bill Abbott Magic started I think 2010 that's when we started the website but we were selling magic at, at my, all my lectures so I would teach tricks and I would sell the props so I would have you know back then it was you know DVDs I would sell DVDs of the instructionals on how to how to do these tricks, but it was really it, it, it's a combination of hobbyists who have a have an interest in magic, but mm-hmm. then there's also professionals, and that's what we that's predominantly our customer now. Either they're what you'd call like a weekend warrior, like he's you know he's accountant by day, but right, on right. Saturday and Sunday he does kids parties or he does he does uh, magic for the for the local Kiwanis club or whatever. Right. But what we offer is here's tried tested material that I've actually performed. Right for human beings for 100 performances or 10,000 right. performances. So they're purchasing something that they know that they can perform right, right away. Um, so the average person, if you want to learn a card trick, yeah, I mean, you, you could probably get a card trick from me, but that's not that's not really, you're not the target market. The target market is people who probably want to make a living or make money doing the magic, right? right? Which, is a, which is a very small, it's it's a, you know increasingly smaller group of people, right? Um, yeah, you have co-authored or, or written four books. I understand. I've written more, well, but there's yeah, there's four that yeah. I know the four you mentioned. You 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 mean? And uh, yes, I I've written four books. Sorry to answer your question. Yeah, I'll try to be more succinct. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I've written more, but I don't want to confuse you with that. So let's let's move on with, with, what, you, confused. with what you know. As yeah. you can see with a little deck of cards. No, okay? no, no. no, no, it's good. It's good. Um, and, and uh, of course, I, I looked through each one of them or mm-hmm. whatever links I could find. Yep. And uh, I think it was a cocktail card magic mm-hmm. one. And uh, there was something interesting in there. I think it was that one about the invisible deck. Yes. And they're given credit to a, a gentleman named Fields yeah. that got it from some, uh, was it, uh, Joe, Joe, Joe Berg. Berg yeah. right. Eddie Fields, Joe Berg. Yeah. Right. And in, in, in the write-up in, in uh, on Wikipedia, mm-hmm. it says that in uh, 2008, uh, you reveal a discovery that you made while screening a short film entitled Oliver the Eighth. Yes. Okay. I'd like to show you a little clip on that. And then, because I, mm. I read the entire thing, but I really couldn't figure out what is it that you discover. So mm. maybe you can help me with that. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see how this works. Wrong one. Huh? Wrong video. Oops. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I'm glad you did your homework. This is great. 
nice weather we had tomorrow. It certainly... It's his own sound effects, yeah. looked at it and I read it over and over again what is it that you discover mm -hmm. can you of course can I can enlighten explain. me on that of please course. what is it that you discover so histor the invisible deck so there's there's tricks there's uh, again these are things that you can research but you can if you look up the Svengali deck that's probably the most popular deck if you were to go to a country fair Um, if you go to, down to St. George Street to the Magic Shop, if you were to, that's the that's the deck of cards that most, that's the deck of cards that's been most uh, de demonstrated to sell. So here, here's, I'll show you a deck of cards, $10, it's yours, because it does a lot of things. You know, you can demonstrate all this magical th stuff with this one deck of cards. The Invisible Deck became super popular with performing magicians because it had such an interesting premise. The interesting premise of this invisible deck that becomes visible. I can perform it for you if you want. Oh, awesome. Yeah, because that, that way, I mean, why explain it when I can just do it? Uh, but more importantly, the invisible deck presentation, because that was your six of clubs. I want to put this back where it was because uh, <laughs> there we go. So the invisible deck, it's a presentation for a card trick, but previous to My discovery of this, I'm, I'm a huge Laurel and Hardy fan. So for me, I had seen every Laurel and Hardy as a kid. As I said, we used to rent 16 millimeter movies. We used to watch Laurel and Hardy movies all the time. And they were our favorites. My my sister, my my oldest sister and I, and I have two younger sisters as well. But we used to, Laurel and Hardy, we would just devour all those. They're, they're mostly shorts. They had a few feature length, obviously. But um, but in Rewatching and seeing this, I'm like, this is the Invisible Deck presentation. And if you watch beyond that that clip, Laurel performs an invisible. To pick a card. Right. They right, take a right, card. Right. Stick it back in. Is this your card? Yes. Now that's the premise. But premises are everything in magic. So I did a I did a lecture at Magic Live in Las Vegas in 2012. You said or like 2009. I can't remember what whatever whatever the date whatever date you said is is correct. I pref I demonstrate this. I showed the video, and I talked about the the invisible like present the 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 history of it. So previous to Joe Berg, who created the 
of the method. Eddie Fields uh, apparently created the, but I found a a previous. It's like it's like it's like law, you know. You find like a previous case that proves something, then you that's that's now the precedent. It's like that. So this was you know this movie that's from the nineteen twenties thirties. Uh, don't quote me, but uh, predates what we had known before. Uh. So my discovery was that well, here's the invisible deck presentation. So this is you know let's let's so I'll show you right now. So I say. Uh, have you seen one of these, sir? A time or two. It's embarrassing to see one of these. I'm gonna I'm gonna open this. This is actually a, a deck of playing cards. Would you do me a favor? Would you would you shuffle the cards? Uh, take them out of the box first. So. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't I didn't I didn't warn you. I didn't warn you. I'll take I'll take I'll take the box. You, <laughs> perfect. Now now shuffle the cards. Fantastic. And make sure make sure you cut them. I don't want you to fool around. Fantastic. You drop one. That's okay. Now, make sure that make sure they're squared up. Now, I want you to spread the cards out. Fantastic, and pick out a card, any card you want. Pick it out. Fantastic, and and turn it over so you can see it. I'm I, I'm going to gather up the deck like this. So turn it over so you can see it, and memorize it. I want you to really see a card in your mind, and now do me a favor and stick it back into the deck, anywhere you'd like. Fantastic. Now, and I put it back inside the box that I kept over here. Now, this has all been in our mind. You know, we, we, we've been playing along. You did very well. Most people don't play along that well, but you, you did. You, have you obviously have an active imagination. <laughs> the amazing thing is you only mentally selected. You, you pull a thing. I think, I hope you were focusing on a card. Did you see a card in your mind? Yes, I did. All right. Psychiatrist, psychiatrists are standing don't, by. Don't if tell you, me <laughs> the card. <laughs> what was the name of the card that you saw? You can say it out loud now. Three of diamonds. Now that's crazy, right? I mean, it'd be crazy if I were to know that it was the three of diamonds before we were to begin. All right. Now the invisible deck presentation, now that stops and now the invisible deck becomes reality. And you said the three of diamonds. Right. So if I go along here like this and I will show you that out of all these cards here, there's only one card that's upside down. Because when you stuck it in, the cards the, the cards were upside down, and if, and if that's the that's that's pretty crazy. Uh, that's tripped out, brother. That's a little tripped out. That's really tripped out. That is really tripped out. That's really tri that's tripped out. So Sorry. that's 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 the invisible deck. That's, that's, that's tripped I mean, out. It's, it's it's classical. You I know, know I know it's not real, but it's tripped out. It's pretty good. It's a good trick. I mean, if you're, if, if you're, it, this is the thing. That's tripped out. It, it has, it, it has inherent interest because it's weird from the beginning. You're, yeah. you're dealing with an invisible deck. So it already has like, people are already interested. Even if you have no interest in magic, you're like, what's this weirdo doing? Why is he shoveling an invisible deck? His imagination is fantastic. Oh, and when they, when they name the card and it's the one that's upside down in the real deck, it's like, what the heck's going on here? So let's. That's the invisible deck presentation. Wow. So my discovery was that Laurel and Hardy, there's actually, actually the whole sequence without the without the actual magic part, but they actually the whole sequence is there, and that was my discovery. And the and the day and the timing, yes, because I think it was yes. 42, 1942 or something when Fields, that's when the movie yes and exactly the movie was way before way that. before that I think the twenties or thirties I, 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 I perhaps it's just coincidence I do right? have that I do have the, the discourse written up that I that I presented so Magic Live the Magic Live convention it happens every year it used to happen every two years but then it happened every year it's one of the largest conventions in the U S uh, for Magic so like all the, internationally probably the biggest if not the biggest at least in the top three it happens in Las Vegas. Everyone comes, you know, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great <laughs> showcase. And Stan Allen, who magic magazine was, it was it magic live was what the magic magazine came out of, but he, yeah. And I, I can't remember if I, I must, I must have, must have approached him. And I just said, Hey, I've got this great discovery that I made. I would love to do a lecture on it. They did a very short, 20 minute presentation, but I showed that video. I showed the, the rest of the video where Stan Laurel gets them to choose a card and yeah, yeah, it's yeah. basically invisible. Drops them all over drops the floor. Them on the floor and yeah, you miss up. one. And yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, we, you know, we did a very short version, but right. I, on right. stage, I would do something like that. It was like, oh, take the cards. Oh, you drop one, pick one up from the floor and put it, you know, it, it's all in the play of theatrics. Of, of it. And, yeah, theatrics of it and, and the fun of it. And the more that the more that people play along and sometimes 
the, the less they play along can be funny too because like you shuffle the cards. No, you really need to shuffle them. And they're kind of like, you know, like I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you can make sound effects like you did. Very good. Far out, man. Yeah. yeah that, that was pretty cool. I mean, that was pretty trippy. Yeah. Uh, That's yeah, my well, job, right? Yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, if yeah. it wasn't trippy, you'd be like, can, yeah. we, can we get yeah. somebody else to? Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> the podcast, please. The Boyd Mystery. Oh. Mm hmm. Now, this was a true story. This mm -hmm. really happened. Yep. And then somehow somebody turned it into a magic presentation or something. Yeah. And you provide that on your website yeah, to so aspiring mag magicians. Is that right? It's a semi-interesting story, at least to me. So right beside the magic section in my high school library. So they had a little magic section. Where, you know, I always go to the seven... Uh, Again, don't quote me, 793.8, whatever the, you know, the Dewey Decimal System. I would go to that every every library I got my, I got the chance to walk into. Even today, if I walk into a library, I'm going to that 793.8 because that's the magic section every single time. Every so, library? Every library that I walk into, yeah, because I could care less about anything else. So I go, go into there, go straight to the magic section, just to see what magic books they have. Right. I've gone to the magic, you know, I, I, I live in the island in San, in the San Anastasia Island. The, I've, I've scoured that library. I've done the, the main St. Yeah, John's yeah. Library here uh, on the mainland. I always go there because it's always fascinating to me, like, see what magic books are there. Um, I, I donate a lot of magic books to libraries because when it's a pitiful, like the St. John's library, I need to donate a few cause it's, it's awful. They, they need more mm -hmm. because I mean, that's how I got into magic was like, I really learning more and more about magic was, was the literature was the, the books of magic. That's where right, you learn right. the most anyways, long story longer beside, <laughs> <laughs> beside that magic section was, uh, the Dewey Decimal system. It's like. It's biographies. So then I saw this book, uh, uh, the Boyd, something, and, and um, Edwin Alonzo Boyd. I can't remember the, the, the exact title of the book, but it captured my attention. As I was looking at the magic books, I saw this Edwin Alonzo Boyd. He was a, he was a robber. He was, and it was from my hometown in Toronto. Uh, I pull it off the shelf. I, I checked it out because I was like, oh, this is cool. He's a, he's a, he's a, he, bank, he was robbing banks in Toronto. I live in Toronto. This is fascinating to me. Go home, start reading about it. And sure enough, he, you know, he's in neighborhoods that my grandmother lived in, like older Toronto neighborhoods. And uh, I asked her about it. And she said, oh, yeah, we, we, we knew Eddie Boyd. Um, a police, a police officer that lived in the neighborhood was killed by by either either Boyd. I think it was somebody in Boyd in the Boyd gang his group of, you know, uh, criminals. So that's was her touch point was like, oh, yeah, we we had someone who passed away who got shot by the Boyd gang. So it was, it was all very real to me. Like this was, you know, this really happened and in a neighborhood and in, in the world of where I lived and where I went to school. So studied it. The fascinating thing to me was that he escaped from the Don jail in Toronto, which is what at that time was the major was the main jail not once but twice so to me it was like this guy's this guy's like a, he's like literally like a magician he was uh he would like rob a, banks like el chapo yeah yeah el chapo yeah exactly he would just you know how did he do that well he's who knows it's magic he was like he was kind of like the gentleman bank robber he would go in and be very polite and you know and half the time he wouldn't have a gun. He would just hide, pretend he would have a gun. They would be like, oh, he has a gun. And he would give me all the money. He would be very polite to everyone and, and walk out. And he just kept bit, getting better. But he, he became more violent, you know, later on because he, he robbed like eight or eight or ten banks before he was caught. Thrown into the Don jail. He escaped. Uh, got caught again. Went back to the Don jail. Escaped again. And then disappeared. So later on, they they eventually found him in British Columbia. He moved he moved across the other side of Canada, um, and he was driving a bus for a, for a senior's home and you know, lying low and you know, but he was found out. But I was always fascinated with the story of how he dis, how he escaped. So he is the first time he escaped. He was he was put in a cell with a friend of his by the name of Eddie um, uh, Eddie Jackson. Don't quote me, Eddie Jackson. But but his friend had an artificial leg, like a like a lost it in the war. But he had like a like an appendage or whatever, like a 
uh, what do you call them? Uh, prosthetic. Back in the 1950s, so it was, you know, made of wood or whatever. Right, right, right. right. Um, but what they didn't know is that he had he had snuck a, a hacks piece of a hacksaw into the leg, like he had, he had snuck it in, and every night at about three in the morning, they would you know they they would un- take the leg off, pull out the hacksaw, and start working on. The, there's bars to the outside, on the outside window. They started hacking away at, you know, and then they would take you know, some toothpaste or soap or whatever, rub it with the dirt and like fill in the little cracks. So like every, every night they would do this until they eventually let it, they cut it free and they would escape. And that's how they escaped the first time. So I took that premise and thought it'd be a great magic trick. So I found some old photos of Edwin Alonzo Boyd, recreated them. And I, unfortunately I didn't bring it with me, but so the, the effect is that I have this, I have like a, a it's wrapped in paper, like, I don't know if you remember, my, my grandma used to keep photos in the kind of an onion skin type paper. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it fold it up, place it, and then talk, tell a story. And then when I opened it up, I'd hold, the, hold up the photo and the, the, the Boyd image, like the picture of him that was in all the papers or whatever, it would be gone, would be cut out from the actual photo. And when I do this at, at cocktail parties or house parties, uh, I then say, you know, he would... He would end up in the weirdest of places. He actually ended up in British Columbia, you know, where all the cr- criminals live. They all live there, um, which is obviously a joke, mostly in Canada because <laughs> Canadians, you know, all the hippies live there. So um, I said, but he's ended up in a weird place tonight. And I say, where is he? And he's like, you're sitting on him. And so they would stand up and he would, he's, you know, the image of him is, is like there, he's, he's right, sitting, right, he's right. underneath him. So that, that was the effect. And I performed that for years and years and years at restaurants and mostly, obviously mostly in Toronto because people, a lot of people had connections or they knew about him or right, right. he was kind of like a legendary, there was actually a movie about him, and, oh. uh, which is very good. Um, if you look it up, Edwin Alonzo Boyd or Boyd Mystery or Boyd mm-hmm. Gang movie, it'll come up. It's a great movie. Wow, that's so you have to prepare it in advance. Yes. Got it, got it, yeah, got, yeah. It, got it. I was really turned on by the thing. Mm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I watched it. Uh, yeah. Of course, I tried to figure out how this sure, happened. Now, when you saw the thing, uh, tell, tell the audience what the thing is. Sure. Well, I'm going to remind you that the thing, the, <laughs> the, the, not the, 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 methodology of the thing is in uh was in the show that you saw at the Casa Monica this is the original show that I've been doing for the past the year the first one that yeah there's a yeah. new show now but yeah. I don't know if you remember but there was a there was an invisible floating lime right right that uses the same methodology so ah. it's like floating in space and all of a sudden it becomes real now the thing is essentially similar in the sense that it's it's an invisible object floating. And then when you, so uh, to describe. To you have describe, a handkerchief of some type. It's, 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 yeah, it's, it's like a cloth or a handkerchief. So that, that when I did it, when I first started doing it, I did it at kids' parties. That was kind of like, it was the big closer of the show. I would have someone come up and I have a, I have a clear clear box so you could see through it made of acrylic or whatever. Right. And I would have a kid come up and they would hold the box. I would open the box and say, there's something inside here. Shh, quiet. If we're quiet enough, it'll come out. Of course, that gets all the kids, you know, attention. Then I take a cloth and, you know, it'd be empty and I'd place it over top of the the box that the kid was holding and all of a sudden it would come floating out. If you, it, you know, again, like you said, if you search this on YouTube, you'll see it. It starts floating out. This, inv- yeah, yeah. this invisible object and then just take a peek and I would take a peek and it would be, it wouldn't be there. And then I would, I would lift up the handkerchief and there'd be nothing there. So it was really the, <laughs> the floating of an invisible object. And then I would put it back on. And all of a sudden it would reappear in space and then I push it down inside the box and it's nonsense, but it, it's, it's a very magical looking levitation. It, very impressive. Yeah. Of nothing. <laughs> so it was a creation of mine based on some methodology that came before it, but but really like a, a new presentation and a new style of doing it. Variations invis- on a given thing. Yeah, but like- an invisible object, object had never really been done before um, effectively, but also practically. I used to do this in birthday parties where kids are like on the floor, the worst possible conditions. You know, you, you every birthday party, well, most birthday parties are going to go to these big... I've got all these big mansions in Forest Hill and Toronto and 
I'd go in, they we're gonna put you in the in the in front of the you know the fireplace, whatever you get there. And of course there'd be a big mirror behind you. I'm like, well, oh, geez, like you know, like the, the kids are gonna see all the tricks. Right. So you have to you, you I had to create a show that would work in that environment. Right. So the thing right. is one of those things that's like very practical. It's a very mind-blowing, visually brilliant and lovely looking illusion, but also very practical because it doesn't matter what angle they were looking at. Right, right. And I didn't, you know, it, it I, I didn't, you know, there, the way that it works, I'm not going to explain anything too much, but, but the hint I'll tell you is like, there's no threads. So it's not like I need to hook up some threads before I come. I can just walk in and start doing it. Right. So uh, the thing was something that came out of my birthday party years in high school because I wanted something practical that looked really cool because I had kind of a dream. I, I thought that I had was like to, to create this illusion of like an invisible floating thing that would be, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, the mummy or not the mummy. Sorry, sorry, the Invisible Man, yeah, the yeah. old movie. You right. know, you take off his bandages and he wouldn't be there. Right. It was kind of like that. It was like you'd see this thing floating, and then you'd you'd lift up, lift away the cloth, and there would be nothing there. Right. I just I I just love the intrigue and the the natural curiosity. Of that, the natural thrill of that. By it is watching. intriguing. It's very intriguing. Yeah. You, you, it, it looks like there is something in there. Yeah, a broomstick or something. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. And when you, uh, if you again, if you YouTube, if you take a peek at it on YouTube, you'll see. Uh, I do. I'm doing it on the street. Yeah, you know, that's in Toronto. Right. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And so obviously, it's like, well, he's you know, he's on the street. How can right. this, you know? And it, it's one of those things. I know a lot of street performers adapted it into their acts because it was. It's one of those things that you can literally do in the middle of a street. You can do it. Lots of people in Las Vegas and New York and people that travel and through Europe, they started adding because it, it drew a crowd. People were like, what's that thing? It's floating in space. And then all of a sudden it wouldn't be there. So like nothing, nothing. And then once you get enough people, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. So all of a sudden people, everyone's like, what's going on here? There's a guy that's doing the thing with it, the invisible object. So right. people, like, right. more people. And for, for street performance, that's what they need, right? They need to gather more people. Sure. To see what's going on, right? And that's it. Was a good, it's, it's a good crowd getter for right. a street performer. You know, I, I'm very impressed with the resiliency that you and your family have shown. Because I remember, no, oh, thank when you, your guys first came here, yeah, five, the, five, almost six years ago, yeah. yeah. All the energy, all the effort you guys put down down in the first floor, yeah, and then pandemic hit, yeah, and I just felt terrible for you guys because there's a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of energy, yeah, and. Uh, and then I was so happy when I heard about the Casa Monica thing. Yeah. How did that come about? Because that's, you're, you're like a yeah. resident there doing a residency. Yeah, actually, yeah residency. So we're, we're there every Friday and Saturday night now doing a show. Um, and Third, have been for a year. And second year, year, third year now? Second year? For, first, uh, so one year, three weeks. Yeah. So, yeah, again. <laughs> Stop me if I'm rambling. But but we, we had... We're setting it up. Our primary reason to come and say Augustine was to set up a show here. So in addition to finally get moving here and, you know, getting our green card and then moving here uh, five, almost six years ago was to 
this is a tourist town. We we thought this is the perfect location. We traveled all up and down Florida. We vacationed here every every winter. So we had seen a lot of Florida, obviously or Orlando for Disney when the kids were young. But we traveled up and down the West Coast, the East Coast, and then fell in love with St. Augustine because we thought, and, and rightly so now that we've done it, but kind of the perfect fit for a small boutique magic show, something where, you know, it's not, you're not entertaining 100 people. But you're seeing magic, in my opinion, at its best because it's so close and everyone's. So we we our original thought and and if it had, you know, if the pandemic had, had it hadn't happened, we'd probably be doing it was to create our was to make our own, to have our own thing. So don't you know, we're not, you know, we have our own space. We make it the way we want to make it. So we started by doing uh, creating it in the building that we're in right now. In the basement, the lowest level, not the basement. There's no basements in Florida, but right. the lowest level here <laughs> yeah. where we had a, I, I don't know how many square feet, 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, something like that. Something like that. Yeah, about that. We, it was basically three offices that right. we connected, right. you know, with some secret passageways and did some crazy right, right. things. But we recreated, we created this thing because it's an old cigar factory. We created this old cigar factory room that was like you're walking in. There's like floor to ceiling cigars and you know, cigar boxes and crazy things. And then from within that room, you would then, there would be a secret, you know, uh, shelf or, or wall that would open up. And then now you'd be in the champagne room. And that was floor to ceiling uh, foliage and had, you know, gold monkeys and crazy lights. And that would that would be where you would, there'd be a champagne room. So you'd be, everyone would right. serve a glass of champagne. I would come out at that point and do some sleight of hand. And then you'd move into the showroom after that, which was, uh, again, a, a third room. And again, it was, you know, similar to what we have in the Casa Monica now, where it's like a, you know, 30, 30 seat right, theater, right. mini theater, where right. you can really see the magic close up, like right. you're in touching distance to the magic. And that was, that was the, that was the, that was the, the original vision. And we, we basically took all that. We came to the point, we were literally going to open in March of 2020. We would, we had geared ourselves. We'd been in the space in September, about six months. We were ready to open. And then the pandemic happened. And oh, then we man. were waiting. Okay. So, you know, originally it was like, yeah, we're waiting a couple of weeks. So it's all going to blow over. So two weeks came a month and then it's two months, then it's three months. And I just realized like, we got to either, we got to let get out of this lease because we can't, you know, we'd already, you know, dumped a lot of money. Oh, I know you did. And we were in the middle of, we had just got approved for the plumbing. Because we right. you had you to know, put that back for We had to put a grease trap yeah, yeah. just to serve alcohol. We had to put together. Amazing. We basically took, we basically took an office space and turned it into a bar. Yeah. You right. know, essentially with the plumbing and the, and uh, I mean, we, we really didn't know what we were going to get into eventually, but, but essentially, it got to a point where we uh, we just realized, okay, this is not happening. So we pull everything out. Our lease was up in September, so we just let it go, obviously. Pull all their crap out, emptied out a room in our house, dumped it all in there, in there, in our garage. <laughs> we had a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I was depressed for about three months. I, I can't imagine. I, 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 can lived, I imagine. lived in bed, and then I, yeah. and then I came out of bed, <laughs> and I just realized, <laughs> well, let's... What, what's our next step? Because we can't, this can't continue. And, you know, rightly or wrongly, Florida opened up sooner than anywhere else. And I realized that we need to switch gears because we, we, we still need to make something happen because we're, you know, in, in retrospect, I realized now, and I think it was a learning curve, but I didn't really want to manage a bar or, you know, manage you know, to servers and all this other thing, I realized like, what do I, what, what is, what am I good at? I won great, I won skill. That's to perform magic. Let's do that. So the, what we did was, what I did in my, my brain was like, let's just partner with somebody that does the other thing really good. And I'll do what I, we'll do what I do well. And Rebecca, my partner, she's great at administrating great at you know customer service amazing at you know making things happen so for me it was like let's just partner with whoever we can and we really wanted to and our original vision was a five-star experience we really wanted to make it a night out a, a date night uh you know like you're going to a real 
going to a ballet or an opera or a thing. It was like that class act, class act, absolutely world class. Yeah, you know, I knew I knew the show was at that level. It, it, absolutely, it's just convincing yeah. people that it's at that level. So right, what? Right. So I really own, like, my only choice. Not that I didn't have other choices, but my only choice was the Casa Monaco Hotel for the history of it, for the aesthetic of it, and for the for the hospitality level that they that they do. Um, that was really my only choice. So I basically took all our, I, I thankfully, well, after we had set the whole thing up downstairs here, we made videos. I made, we made, took beautiful photographs and it created this beautiful leather bound book of all of the whole vision with text, images. And I basically, you know, printed that and shipped it to Richard Kessler, who owns who owns the hotel. You didn't know him prior to that? No, no, no. You just a cold call. You just cold. Oh man, cold call. My man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, crazy, awesome. But one one thing that I knew that he he's an he appreciates art. He's an art collector. He likes he loves artists. He showcases artists in all of his hotels. That's a big thing that he does. So I knew going into it that this could work or this could be a convincer because I knew that this was something that was. Obviously, he has a passion for. So if he can, if we can connect our passions. My passion is to create this experience, and what his passion is to also create experiences through art, through beautiful buildings, through beautiful architecture, through beautiful um, and a high level of of service, etc. So it was again a crapshoot. Packaged it up, shipped it to him, and waited three months. Didn't hear, and I'm just like, well. Oh. <laughs> maybe, we'll, maybe we'll maybe we'll what's plan B? And I started looking at other locations, other things that we could do. And then he called me out of the blue, and basically, you know, within the same conversation, phone conversation, he said, "Sit and tell me. Here's my, you know, send me an email. How do we make this happen? I want to make this happen." I'm like, oh man! I'm like, and that was like, oh my gosh, fantastic! That so was magic, magic. Yeah. yeah, it was kismet. It was it really, it really became so. In that moment, uh, that's when it all, you know, it now it took, I'm trying to remember, it was May, it was literally, it was took a year though to get to the point where we could, because there's a lot of things, we we finally chose a room, but then that room had to be outfitted. I, you know, we, 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 uh, we outfit, you know, we put a lot of money again back into what we wanted, but, you know, was, was floor to ceiling, you know, four walls, you know, velvet curtains you know proper stage lighting and then to create you know it was also in a room that had beautiful uh moroccan arch with hand-painted you know gold leaf and but it had no door so originally we were thinking well it was through, through a curtain but it it empties onto the into the lounge which right, which is, right. a, is live music and sure. lots of people so it's super loud so we realized very quickly that the curtain wasn't going to work so we had to build a custom door into that space. So it's, you know, it's like 13 feet high and seven feet uh. wide. So that, that again, it took time and effort and energy and money, but it was like, again, I, I again, we, you know, either blind stupidity or <laughs> we just were, we were just like, it's going to happen. I mean, what else? I had no other option in my mind. I was just like, Let's just let's just keep going. What are we gonna do? What else are that's, we gonna do? That's awesome, and I'm really yeah. proud of you guys. That's, that's, oh, just, thank you. You you made it, it happen. Was, it was, you didn't uh, give up. Yeah, you didn't you know bend down and, and say oh screw it. You went for it. And it you also made it comes through years of traveling to do what I do. So I for the last 22 years I've been traveling. I've been living in airports, you know, flying to do shows, flying here, flying there, throughout the states, the U.S., across. I've been to 12, 13 countries now. So all of that. Also adds up to like, yeah, I'm not getting younger. I don't, do I really want to live in an airport? That's right. not really, and air, air travel is getting so ridiculous that I'm just like, I just would, for me, I don't want to do this anymore. How, how do we, how do we, how do we, I'll do anything to make this happen. Let's just make this happen. How do we make it happen? Money's made every day. Let's figure it like we can make money to make whatever happen. It's, it's, that's what's, what's important. The important thing is that I'm using what I can do to do what I do. And, and that's, that was really the most <laughs> crazy yeah. motivation. And it's a great mo a role model for your kids, for your boys. I think so. Yeah. Hell yeah. 
to see their I think dad. They think I've been but yeah, yeah, the same. But <laughs> you made it happen. <laughs> right. I want to thank you for coming in. Uh, my pleasure. I have more, but we we can do another one in the future sure. if you're up to it. Absolutely. Uh, but I, I, um, thank you so much. And thank you. You made my I just made my night. Me too. Thank you, brother. Cheers. Thank you. Salute. Salute. Magic. Magic. The, the magic juice. <laughs>